Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to UCSF Department of Family and Community Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, uh, happy Friday. We have a wonderful presentation for you today um, by Dr. Megan Mahoney. The title of her talk is Demoralization in Medicine with a Focus on Strategies and Solutions. Um, just as a reminder before we get started, this session is recorded, um, like all other Grand Round sessions. Um, uh, it's also hopefully an interactive session, so we would encourage you to use the Q&A session, um, I'm sorry, the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen there to ask questions, um, which, uh, which Megan will hopefully answer live um, uh, at the end of the session or to share your comments. Um, if you have thoughts about today's Grand Rounds or suggestions for future Grand Rounds, we'd encourage you to fill out the evaluation that we will send towards the end of the session. Um, or if you just have one someone else you wanna suggest, including yourself for a future grand rounds, that would be great. Um, if you're interested in seeing prior um, uh, family community medicine grand rounds, they're all loaded up on our website, um, uh, the department website under uh, FCM grand rounds as today's will also be, and it'll probably be posted in a couple of days. Um, and last but not least, as always, I wanna thank our phenomenal tech team, um, Roy Johnston, Erica Mitchell, and uh, Ben Wallen, who are helping us uh, stay on track today. Um, so with no further ado, I want to welcome um, Megan Mahoney. Um, uh, her talk today on demoralization in medicine with a focus on strategies and solution um, really revolves around her important work in this area. Changes in the healthcare system have altered the nature of primary care clinicians' interactions with patients and our sense of empowerment to improve the practice environment. Profound health disparities have caused disillusionment and dwindling faith in the systems for which we work. Strategies and solutions lie in the fact that we are internally motivated when we believe in what we're doing and feel like we're part of a community. The objective of today's presentation is to review the evolution of demoralization in medicine and discuss evolution for coalition building to drive change and restore well-being. Um, and uh, in case you haven't uh, yet me met yet yet met Megan. Um, I would say that you should meet her, um, but just in case uh, you haven't met her yet, I will share her bio with you, which is that Dr. Megan Mahoney is the chair of the UCSF Department of Family and Community Medicine. Throughout her career, Megan has built and led sustainable initiatives in provider engagement, quality improvement, and DEI for healthcare organizations. Her research has focused on the impact of primary care team cohesion on burnout and the influence of diversity and inclusion on individual and team well-being. Uh, Megan has presented on team wellness as a keynote speaker at national and international meetings, and she served as a long-term faculty for the National Chief Wellness Officer course, which is an executive um, program for physician well-being leaders. Um, as many of you probably already know, Megan earned her MD at, uh, right here at UCSF um, in the School of Medicine, and she also uh, completed her family medicine residency at UCSF, and I am delighted to welcome Megan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Margo. It's an honor to spend this time with, uh, with you all, and thank you for the nice introduction. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to talking to you all about this topic of demoralization in medicine. I have to say, whenever I'm invited to these talks, I do feel a little sense of imposter syndrome because I don't think of myself as a real expert in this. However, a number of my roles in leadership have helped me think about this area, and I'm going to share some anecdotes with you today. And Margo, I'm so glad that you encouraged uh, interaction because I think we actually all are experts in this area. And I encourage you to share your comments and your anecdotes as we go along as well. Every level of healthcare feels some level of this uh, distress. And I think that it's really great that I'm following Dr. Fine's Ram Rounds presentation last month, which was truly terrific, that highlighted a lot of the distress around the healthcare system. We feel it and um, we're seeing how it can affect ourselves, our colleagues, our patients, it affects us in our personal lives, and we're all struggling with the, um, the aftermath of, of this topic. So what I hope that we can do today is talk about some strategies and solutions, some real tools that, um, that you can um, carry with you. And again, I um, encourage you to share um, some things that have helped you as well with the, with the rest of the group. And I'll try to highlight all of the topics looking at this 
through a primary care lens. Um, and so you'll see that in the, in the next slides. So I wanted to call out on the next slide, the pivotal moment in 2014, when our uh, UCSF's uh, Center for Excellence in Primary Care uh, director, co-founder, Dr. Tom Bodenheimer, published this article in the Annals of, of Family Medicine, uh, which was a concept that built off of the three dimensions of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim that was initially coined by uh, Don Berwick, but really looking at, in addition to improving the care of individual patients and promoting the um, health of populations and lowering costs, we must add the dimension of the well being of healthcare providers in order for us to be effective in healthcare. And I really do uh, attribute uh, this article, the quadruple aim to the uh, opening of, of, of this discussion in, in 2014, a really pivotal moment. And we've all heard in the press lately about burnout and how we've um, been seeing record levels of burnout, all time high this last year, 2021 uh, analysis was done. 63% of physicians in the United States experienced some sign of burnout. And just to go through the definition of burnout, it's characterized by depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, low professional accomplishment, at least that sense of low per, uh, personal accomplishment. And it's the result of excessive workload, poor work-life balance, a lack of a feeling of control and purpose in one's work, Burnout among physician um, emerges in the second year of medical school, and it remains a risk throughout training and in our medical practice. And um, we know that this is not limited to just the physicians. And in this talk, I'm going to also review a lot of the data um, on other health uh, professionals. Uh, as it pertains to burnout, especially in the context of, um, of the pandemic. So I wanted to call out our Rachel Willard Grace, uh, who is the director of the Center for Excellence in Primary Care, who uh, helped me think about this talk. And we discussed a lot about how the organization has a lot to do with um, the, the development of burnout and also the response to burnout. It's estimated that 80% of burnout is related to organizational factors. And so I have one thing that I, if I could ask you to do, and that is to, uh, I really wanna emphasize that we are already very resilient as uh, clinicians. And I have some data to point to that. That if I could ask you to just stand up and say out loud, we are already resilient. And in fact, it's really our organizations that need to become resilient as well. And so over the next few slides, I'm going to go over why this is a crisis. What is the impact on our organizations, on our patients, on ourselves? How can leadership step up and what can we collectively do about this? The characteristics of burnout have been associated with a 200% increased odds of major medical errors, particularly among proceduralists is where a lot of the data came from. Burnout can lead to poor overall quality of patient care, lower patient satisfaction, disruption in our personal lives, and also it can lead to major costs for an organization related to high turnover and costs associated with malpractice lawsuits. I think it's interesting how this can be a vicious cycle as well where many of these uh, events like a medical error or a malpractice lawsuit can also be major drivers of burnout. And this is where the opportunity for organizations have in either 
augmenting and increasing that experience of burnout or mitigating burnout. And I've seen it go either way. For example, there has been a major transformation in the area of patient safety, looking at system level issues that contribute to errors when an adverse event occurs. And this um, mostly comes from the airline industry, but my colleague, Jim Bajan, has led this movement and it's, it's across all of our um, healthcare systems where when there's a patient safety event, we look at how the organization could have contributed to it. Still, clinicians often feel minimally supported by their institutions when an error occurs and even during um, you know, something like a litigation. Many of our colleagues, physicians, nurses, other team members are keenly aware of cases like the recent case of uh, Redonda Vaught case in Nashville, Tennessee, where a nurse was convicted of criminally negligent homicide for a medication error. Though the flawed hospital-based medication dispensing system contributed to that error. Clinicians, I think we feel sometimes like if our organizations are not behind us, we might be thrown under the bus. And that can contribute to uh, not only burnout, but also the large attrition that we're seeing among physicians and nurses. So I've seen how supportive patient safety programs, professionalism programs, support during litigation are all ways that organizations can play a major role in combating burnout. So what are the trends? So in this chart, you can see that uh, we have the US general working population on the bottom. And you'll see the middle line is the uh, physicians who are um, in the workforce. And then the very top I created, um, just calling out family medicine in particular. In the most recent year of analysis in 2021, burnout spiked up to 63%. And not on the slide is emotional exhaustion, which also peaked at uh, 39%. Depersonalization is up to 39%. And moderate to severe depression doubled over the last year. And I have some data here on the multivariate uh, variable analysis of the 2021 survey data, where uh, being a woman increased the rate of uh, burnout, the odds ratio by uh, was two. And this is uh, just largely um, already well described, women disproportionately are in a caregiver role and have those uh, responsibilities fall on them disproportionately. Um, especially during the, the pandemic. You can also see that individuals practicing emergency medicine, family medicine, and general pediatrics have a higher risk of, of developing burnout compared to other physicians. But I also wanted to point out that there are um, a lot of studies that point to that this is not a resiliency problem among the physicians. In fact, there are data that suggest that physicians are even more resilient than the general U.S. Uh, po working population. And according to one large study, which used the two-item Connor Davison resilience scale, despite physicians reporting an average of 12 hours uh, more per week than the general US working population, they reported more resilience. And interestingly, physicians who identify in minority racial ethnic groups might even have more resiliency according to these scales and more research is needed in this topic. One potential reason for the high level of resiliency and dedication to medicine among uh, medical students and, um, and physicians who identify as underrepresented in medicine as uh, they have um, uh, more uh, 
increase obstacles and different life experiences that may promote resiliency. And that another potential explanation is survival bias. And it's possible that um, students who, and, and, and physicians who identify as underrepresented in medicine face uh, you know, greater obstacles along the way so fewer students make it through. And so you see uh, a very uh, a resilient group of physicians who, who, um, who actually make it through. So more research is needed in, in this area. So I wanted to give some uh, additional information on the uh, other healthcare workers. So nurses, clinical staff, and non-clinical uh, staff. And this is a survey of 43,000 healthcare workers who were surveyed at April in April 2020 and March uh, between April 2020 and March 2021. And, um, and this included not only physicians, nurses, but also nursing assistants, respiratory therapists, and non clinical staff, such as administrative and food services personnel. And overall, the burnout rate was just around 50%. And the largest contributor to burnout was work overload, a very strong independent predictor of burnout. This gives us a clue of how organizations can be involved in mitigating burnout. I also have it in the next slide that is um, specifically looking at nurses who are working in primary care. And forgive me, I didn't include the table with the data, but um, essentially the same thing where work overwork um, uh, and workload and a low personal uh, sense of accomplishment um, those were the two main findings in this meta-analysis of burnout, of um, burnout studies on primary care nurses. Shifting to another study of all healthcare employees, this is a survey of 410,000 healthcare employees during the pandemic. Tom Lee at um, Press Gamey and team examined factors that correlated um, physicians expressing a strong agreement with two statements on intention to stay with their current employer and um, aspects of their job. And it was interesting to see that inclusive culture was an important contributor, not only for the physicians uh, answering the survey, but for all healthcare workers. I'll also point out that inclusive culture is an important factor for medical school experiences as well. And that we see that medical students who uh, are underrepresented in medicine experience medical training itself more negatively compared to their peers who are not underrepresented in medicine, owning to structural racism and bias that exists in the classroom and also their experience with um, the healthcare delivery system. And two studies, one that was conducted by uh, myself and colleagues, uh, Dr. Beth Wilson and Dr. Shelley Adler, found that faculty who are underrepresented in medicine often feel that these um, initiatives and their ability to support students and mentor students go unrewarded. And that lack of faculty support can also lead to exhaustion related burnout. Several studies have um, backed this up as well. And then there was a series of analyses showing that uh, students identifying as members of the LGBTQ plus community have been shown to experience increased risk of burnout owning to mistreatment as well. So all of these results suggest that the medical school environment may be an area where we can um, see um, some curtailing of, of burnout. I also wanted to point out that profound health disparities have caused uh, disillusionment among, uh, among many during the pandemic. 
and um, a study that was uh, conducted by a colleague, a graduate of the UCSF Family Medicine Program, Kenji Taylor and I, um, and, uh, and others uh, who are also co-authors, interviewed primary care team members and asked them about um, ways in which we might be able to uh, mitigate some of the, the impact of, um, of um, DEI um, issues and mistreatment in the healthcare setting. And um, one of the conclusions was that there is this opportunity for healthcare team members to engage um, with each other in reflection. And I know that this is something that in the Department of Family and Community Medicine uh, is well underway. So many of us saw this uh, article in the New York Times uh, by Eric Reinhardt, who is a physician in, um, in Northwestern University. And this was a perspective that burnout, that whole rhetoric misses the larger issue which is that these are grueling uh, settings that we are practicing under, and that really this is perhaps a growing lack of faith in the systems for which we work. And what has been identified as occupational burnout is actually a symptom of something much deeper. And um, on the next slide, I do invoke uh, Sisyphus, as uh, you know, the Sisyphean task that we are all a part of in healthcare, pushing that boulder higher and higher. Why well, I wanted to give him a little bit of a break here and talk a little bit about the ways in which, uh, first of all, what causes demoralization and the ways in which organiza organizations can, can intervene. So um, I, there's a perception of a loss of control over our work environment. So organizations can help there. Health disparities uh, can cause disillusionment, which I've mentioned earlier. There's a perceived misalignment between what uh, brings us great meaning and purpose in our work and uh, the uh, larger organizational strategy, productivity versus quality, uh, patient safety standardization versus autonomy. And then particularly in primary care, we are affected by the large administrative burden. That is a primary driver for burnout among primary care teams. This is uh, data from a study, I think we can recall in 2019 when it came out that found that about 25% or $760 billion of the $3.6 trillion that U.S. spends on healthcare annually is potentially wasteful. This equates to each person spending an unnecessary $2,500 per year on healthcare. As a result of much of patient and provider advocacy, CMS is starting to make a few changes um, that will improve, for example, the prior authorization uh, approval system, but, um, but much work uh, needs to go into this to improve the situation. So I had a prior authorization that I was working on a couple of weeks ago, and I had to call the Medicare provider line, and I felt like this gentleman in this cartoon. Uh, you know, it's just incredible to think how payers are adding more and more prior authorization steps and increasing first pass claims denials and in fact, um, I think um, some of us saw a stat news investigation that found that artificial intelligence perhaps is even increasing the, um, the, the uptick and denials by health insurance companies for medical claims and, and Medicare Advantage. So, um, so this is an area of focus as well. And so if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to take a pause and just call out this quote um, in the next slide. It's time for an honest look in the mirror. And this was written by a group of um, healthcare leaders, um, people who have been thinking about healthcare organizations 
a colleague, uh, a do, uh, Dr. Tate Shanafel, um, and others who are listed here. And it was a wake up call for me when I read this article that there is a uh, call to action for leaders. There's also a call to action for all of us to uh, to have an impact. Um, you know, I was um, was elected to be the chief of the medical staff, three thousand uh, uh, physicians, right at the um, time of the uh, you know twenty it's spring of twenty twenty, so the beginning of the pandemic. And I remember going to uh, the different wards and handing out meal cards because we thought, you know, let's just try to help here as much as we can. I ran across an old colleague of mine who is a, a primary care uh, physician, also a palliative care physician. And, um, you know, she was um, the main caregiver, her husband, also a, um, a physician, um, and she was juggling schools being out or, you know, does she have to set up the um, remote learning and, um, and for her kids and does she need to be home? And then also a lot of her patients were at end of life and um, and and her, they were not able to see their family members. And I had just never seen um, her um, in that situation, in that um, state. It was really remarkable. I had this, you know, meal card and I was just realizing, no, this, there's so much more that we need to be doing to address this situation. There's so much that physician leaders can do to help realign our goals and organizations, to bring our professional values back into, um, into the organizations because it's all about culture and it's all, all about relationships after all. So what do we do to help my colleague beyond meal cards, what do we do um, to help each other and to help our, our patients ultimately um, so that um, we can stay in this profession that we love so much? Uh, so this was to me an opportunity um, for leadership. So it basically boils down to fundamentally leaders are mismanaging some of the most talented professionals in the healthcare delivery systems and organizations. It has to do with the policies. It has to do with the governance, the compensation plans. It has to do with the fact that many, less than 15% of board members in the nation's top 20 hospitals are health professionals. So uh, um, at all levels of healthcare systems, there are many things that we, we can look at and, um, and improve. So uh, there's been um, some tools that I wanted to introduce uh, to you. And I'll just start with uh, you know, being at the table and speaking the, the language um, at, at those board meetings and um, talking about the business case for wellness. And this is a very powerful tool um, and it's uh, interactive. So I put the uh, QR code here so that you could scan it, take a look at it now, even if you wanted to, and, um, and play plug in your local numbers and then um, and then really try to calculate what the um, the cost of physician burnout is at your organization. This is uh, developed by a mathematical based on a mathematical model that um, that was um, derived by uh, research and industry reports. And uh, and it's it's looking at the costs associated with physician turnover and reduced clinical hours at national and organizational levels. And uh, they they found that at a national scale, physician burnout accounted for approximately uh, seventy five hundred um, uh, dollars per employed physician per year pointing to an economic value for policy and organizational expenditures directed at reducing physician burnout. Other costs of burnout, such as medical errors, med malpractice, liability, patient satisfaction, productivity, organizational reputation, um, those were all, they're not actually even included in, um, in this model. And so um, I have found it um, uh, uh, personally very useful 
to calculate the costs and to also understand what the return on investment might be when we stand up an intervention that is um, is uh, is meant to reduce the um, the the level of burnout in an organization or in a group. I'm happy to go into that further if there are any questions. Another tool that can be helpful among boards and across you know other organizations is um, understanding that um, that a more diverse workforce generates higher profitability with value creation. And these approaches hold um, a similar, um, these approaches can be very helpful when you're thinking about at a management level. So uh, here is the uh, widely cited McKinsey study that found a significant correlation between diverse leadership and financial performance. Uh, companies with ethnic diversity at executive level were 33% more likely to experience above average profitability compared to those who were um, at the bottom, um, um, uh, bottom, uh, um, uh, the top and the bottom quartile. Um, also, uh, considering uh, gender diversity, top quartile companies were 21% more profitable than those were who were in the bottom quartile. And then I also wanted to include a nice summary of the evidence for diversity in all domains of medicine, research, patient care, um, teams, uh, environment, institution. You can see it all listed there. That was authored by Anna Velasquez at UCSF. So UCSF uses this blueprint for organizational uh, uh, response. And this is the approach to supporting uh, well-being for uh, health professionals. And it was uh, based on an article authored by Tate Shanafelt and team. And you can see the reference there. I've summarized it here in the slide. So foundational programs often have to do with, you know, uh, providing support for caregivers or peer support, uh, you know, during uh, times of crises, uh, uh, lactation support in ambulatory um, um, uh, care settings or in the hospital. Also, salary equity reviews is another great example or campus offerings for, let's say, yoga uh, fitness, mindfulness, and um, and you know UCSF departments have largely um, been um, um, embedding more and more dinner or informal networking events, and that's something that we're looking at, and I see happening in pockets of our department as well. These have been very effective, and they're in fact evidence based in um, in reducing uh, burnout. The other part that I wanted to point out is how important it is to be able to measure and assess a level, the level of burnout um, and all the related dimensions of burnout at an organization. And UCSF has a very robust way of doing that. And I'll use this opportunity to encourage those of us who have received an invitation to complete a survey. Uh, the, the, the survey is open now, so please complete it because uh, these uh, data are incredibly important as we start to evaluate where we are, but also to understand the impact of, of various interventions. At the next level would be the, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the next level would be the cultural tran transformation level. So, uh, so you know, we're, we're thinking about, uh, and I'll go into this specifically for primary care, but uh, thinking about ways in which uh, we are, uh, you know, supporting um, individuals so that they have ability to have more control over their immediate work environment, have flexibility in their schedules, or have, you um, uh, an ability to carry out a quality improvement project. Um, and so these are the, the ways in which, um, you know, uh, uh, cultural transformation um, can, can, can drive uh, well-being um, in a healthcare system. And, um, and then as, uh, as those foundational programs are there, culture and, and willingness to improve well-being and focus on that and prioritize that, the next stage would be to pilot different interventions and put them through rapid cycles of improvement and have an engine and ability to do that. And then once those interventions have been identified, then to come up with a plan for sustainability. 
um, and, and marching through uh, the different stages um, in the organizational re response is, um, is an explicit strategy that many departments and organizations are, um, are engaging in. Thanks, Ben. So now it's time for um, uh, a video where, um, you know, I just, I, I like this video just because it's a reminder of, um, of the different ways in which individual uh, providers can get engaged in, in removing barriers and improving their immediate work environment. Thanks, Ben. So there's this big barrier that's been identified. Everybody's hopping over the obstacle. And then you have that third donkey who is thinking about the problem, creating a SMART goal, putting together all the drivers that are causing the barrier, piloting an intervention. And hey, it worked. <laughs> so, and removing that barrier, thank you. So I think that what has um, inspired me to try to be the third, uh, the third donkey, <laughs> and um, and just to try to really remove those immediate barriers. And um, and if you were to follow the video there, you'll see that the next video is um, about a team of donkeys working together to remove different parts of the the, the fence, and so that they can uh, you know create a gate and get through. So, um, so thank you for indulging me there. Um, but particularly around primary care and thinking about the primary care blueprint for an organizational change, uh, really the emphasis is going to be on teams and on relationships and on health equity. And I'm reminded of um, a, a Martin, a, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. quote that I hold near, near and dear to me, which is we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I think that there is a, a, um, a manifestation of that that occurs in the, the healthcare setting. So the first step is again, to engage leaders, to think about ways in which um, we can optimize team care so that everybody feels like they are um, empowered to make a difference and practicing at the top of their scope and that they're respected and feel included and that there is appropriate peer-to-peer -peer communication that's bi-directional and that the patients are involved in that as well. For um, you know, increasing efficiency, once we have real clarity, we have those workflows down, we are engaged in, let's say, electronic health record initiatives that will reduce those obstacles and those barriers and the, um, and the work environment. Um, so, so really trying to minimize that administrative uh, waste and also um, other EHR related waste to increase efficiency. We also would focus on promoting autonomy and flexibility. So looking at ways that we can maybe even self-schedule, we could schedule our own um, a, a, a patients um, and the template, or even thinking about ways in which we can be empowered to um, test new models of, of care, such as group visits or um, um, you know, um, community outreach um, and health events and also um, having the ability to readily, and this gets into the next step, uh, readily test um, improvement uh, and, and changes in the work environment. So having the ability to do that rapid cycle of improvement in, in, the, um, in the healthcare setting. So are they going on to foster ongoing improvement? Are the uh, members of the healthcare team empowered to be able to carry out a PDSA or if you want to use lean or whatever methodology for quality improvement, um, that should be um, something that is um, that will be available uh, to, to people who are really invested in the well-being of the team. 
centering health equity, centering community, bringing in patient voice into the work that we're doing, and then finally, um, ways in which we can promote a culture of wellness. So, um, you know, I think about the practice inquiry um, um, uh, sessions that, that we have where we bring team members together to discuss hard cases so that we can commiserate and support each other. But then also I'm thinking about the after uh, work uh, gatherings that we can promote, um, you know, whether it's dinner or, um, you know, having um, an, an outing for, um, you know, whatever, uh, karaoke, whatever it is. So I'm promoting that that sense of wellness um, uh, um, and that culture of wellness at work. So I um, wanted to then, uh, you know, go through um, a research that I I, I uh, conducted with a research team around um, evaluation of a team-based care model primary care 2.0. And this uh, model was modeled after the Center for Excellence in Primary Care's 10 building blocks. Uh, so you can see here that there was an inter, uh, implementation clinic and then there were four comparison clinics. And what the, um, the research found was that, um, that adjusted models confirmed an inverse relationship between team development and burnout, which was statistically significant. There was also a relationship between burnout scores at nine and 15 months of implementation. But as soon as the, there was a, um, a, um, a change in the budget and the staffing ratios of the medical assistants supporting the um, healthcare, the primary care providers, that shifted. It was um, it decreased from two to one to 1.5 to one. And just that small change alone then led to an uptick. And, and burnout, as you can see here, com and compared to the comparison clinics. It was associated, the model was associated with stronger team um, dynamic scores, higher visit volumes per day, and decreased labor costs. So, um, so just pointing back to the importance of teams and relationships in, um, in promoting uh, general well being and the association between team cohesion and well being. And I'll just um, wanted to uh, highlight some of the uh, pilot interventions that were then uh, sustained that came out of primary care 2.0. And this was all tested through rapid cycles of improvement. And if you just um, click one more time, you'll see that relational coordination, um, there's just um, on the animation, there's just one more um, advanced ones. Yeah, there. Uh, the um, thank you so much, Ben. Using uh, relational coordination as a framework and um, and how we spend our time, how we communicate with each other. Um, this is uh, initially um, work that was developed by Judy Hoffer Gattel, Jody Hoffer Gattel at Brandeis University, and I had the pleasure of working with her at Brandeis University. These um, relational coordination initially was studied in the airline industry, and it led to a book, The, the Southwest Way, but it eventually made its way into to healthcare. And I just wanted to um, talk about that a little bit. But the uh, these interventions are things that can easily be implemented in a clinic setting to promote those relationships with our team. So regular moments of recognition, morning huddles so that there's bi-directional exchange of information, um, clear a role definition, um, and then you know, quality improvement framework. So I wanted to talk a little bit about relational coordination. So on the next slide, you'll see that, um, um, that there is a, um, a tool here that uh, looks at seven different factors. And you can see that it's evaluation on frequent communication, timely communication, accurate communication, problem solving communication, and then the other domain, shared goals, shared knowledge, and mutual respect. And when, um, a, health, uh, when a healthcare team uh, performs well in these different domains, that is associated with higher performance in um, job satisfaction, in um, quality and efficiency uh, metrics as well. 
And if you uh, advance uh, once, you will see that there is this um, strong correlation, the strong association that's been borne out in several different studies. Um, and the next slide, I have a list of, of different uh, healthcare, different studies on relational coordination in healthcare settings. So here's the uh, map that you could use um, in your own setting. And then uh, these are the different um, studies that, um, that you can see listed here that are referenced that show this association between relational coordination and performance outcomes. And so, um, and then this is also a, um, a study that um, I learned about through Tom Bodenheimer on interprofessional teams, specifically in family medicine, and looking at that relationship between the performance of the team, the efficiency of the team, and burnout among the team members. Um, and so you could see that uh, that burnout for physicians working in interprofessional teams was 69% when the team was uh, deemed to be poorly functioning, not, um, not cohesive, um, and, and was reduced to 21% in, in optimal teams. You can see some of the, um, the factors that were important. One, um, allowing different team members to practice at the top of their scope and see patients independently. And, um, and when those um, those roles then led to a reduction in, um, uh, in clinicians um, spending time on, on additional tasks. So when we think about the traditional organizational structure of, um, of healthcare settings, and we think about how um, you know, we have all these silos in medicine, it's going to be important for us to think about ways in which we can cut across boundaries and break through these silos um, to promote collaboration and to respond to the need to build wellness um, in our teams. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that it's really uh, the future of medicine, a way in which we're going to combat widespread burnout demoralization is, is by building this team, this team of teams. I offered a tool of um, what you can bring uh, to, to, to build that uh, strong optimal team in a local setting. But as we think about it, we can see that really this is our ability for us to build a team of teams which would be adaptable it would be able to create effective responses as the needs change. And it just reminds me a lot of living systems that are self-organizing and um, able to respond to um, their environment as um, unpredictable, unexpected, uncertain things arrive. Teams are able to respond much more resilient than individuals. And this is my last slide, which I'll just point out that um, resilience is a result of linking elements that will allow um, teams to reconfigure and adapt in response to change. It reminds me of a coral reef. This is a quote from a book um, that General McChrystal wrote, Team of Teams. It says resilience thinking is the inverse of predictive hubris. It is based on in a humble willingness to know that we what we that we don't know and we can expect the unexpected. We need a system that without knowing in advance what will be required could adapt to the challenges at hand, a system that instead of converting a known X to a known Y would be able to create an unknown output from an unpredictable input. This will require all of us to be a part of a network of connections and relationships to bridge and heal healthcare and the culture of medicine for the benefits of our patients, our colleagues, and honestly, our profession. So with that, thank you. And I'm open uh, to questions or comments. Well, Megan, I want to thank you for a truly wonderful presentation that um, has given us so much to think about, particularly in reframing burnout from 
an individual issue, something that's an individual responsibility or stressor to something that's really best handled by systems change within organizations. I mean, I think that for me is a big piece of what I will take away from this. Um, there were some wonderful comments in the uh, in the Q and A that I want to call out. A lot of um, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, I want to first of all really recognize uh, Rachel Willard Grace for all of her hard work in this area, which has just been amazing. I um, want to thank uh, Mike Mendoza, former grad, um, uh, for his great comments, and also point out that um, uh, Kristen uh, Marchi shared in the uh, in the chat um, an article from today from the American Public Health Association called "Prioritizing Mental Wellness in the Public Health Workforce," which probably we should all take a look at. Um, because we all want to be the third or maybe fourth, ideally fourth donkey, right? Um, I think we'll probably only have time for one question. So I think the question that I'd like to share with you is, um, what do you see as some of the biggest stressors confronting individual physicians in their careers? And, and how have you seen organizations address these? Right. Um, you know, the, uh, the times that um, I see physicians having the most difficulty is when there's a crisis. There's either a crisis uh, because of, of a pandemic or, uh, um, you know, an unfortunate event at home or, um, or like I was saying, like a lawsuit or something like that. And what I've, um, I've noticed is that uh, when the, the role of a leader is, is particularly important to be able to engage and lean in during that time, if it is a professionalism concern, uh, for example, um, having the um, the role of the leader be able to play that um, the the be able to intervene and not um, be conflict averse. And so I've um, I am particularly interested in ways in which we can empower um, our our leaders and 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 think about leadership development. And I really applaud the efforts um, of Stu of um, of Carmen Liang and Stu Meneker and our department and thinking about ways to support leadership development and provide training opportunities opportunities because that's I think an important part of supporting the well-being of um, our health professionals. I think that's a really important uh, thing for us to continue to advocate for and consider as we move forward. Um, I want to make sure that everyone has time to get to clinic and all the other places that they need to be. So I'm going to thank you, Megan, for your phenomenal talk. I feel like this is the beginning and not the conclusion of a conversation, which is wonderful and as it should be. And uh, just wanted to give you the opportunity to send us off with some words of wisdom before you go. I think we all have an opportunity to lean into this and to um, to uh, use our build our network uh, and to partner with patients and communities to help advocate for change. Uh, and so we uh, we have this opportunity to build our coalition and to use that power for good. So thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. Much appreciated. Have a good afternoon.